Fourteen centuries ago, God sent down the Quran as a guide to all humanity. At the time, the Arab community was in a state of complete degeneration and chaos, but the light brought by the Quran changed it miraculously. Before Islam, the Arabs were a barbarous people who worshipped idols of their own making, believed warfare and bloodshed to be virtuous, and were even capable of killing their own children. However, through Islam, they learned humanity, respect, love, compassion, justice, and civilization. Not only the Arabs, but all the communities which accepted Islam escaped the darkness of the age of ignorance and were illuminated by the divine wisdom of the Quran. Amongst the wisdom the Quran brought people was scientific thinking. The foundation of scientific thought is the sense of curiosity. Because people wonder how the universe and nature work, they investigate and become interested in science. But most people lack this curiosity. For them, the important things are not the secrets of the universe and nature, but their own small worldly profits and pleasures. In communities where people who think in this way are in charge, science does not develop. Idleness and ignorance rule. The Arab community before the Quran was of this type, but the verses of the Quran called upon them to think, to investigate, and to use their minds, perhaps for the first time in their lives. In one of the first revealed verses of the Quran, God drew attention to the camel, a part of Arabs' everyday lives. Have they not looked at the camel, how it was created, and at the sky, how it was raised up, and at the mountains, how they were embedded, and at the earth, how it is spread out? So remind them, you are only a reminder. In many other verses of the Quran, people are instructed to examine nature and learn from it because people can know God only by examining His creations. Because of this, in one verse of the Quran, Muslims are defined as people who think about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Those who remember God, standing, sitting, and lying on their sides, and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you have not created this for nothing. Glory be to you. So safeguard us from the punishment of the fire. As a result of this, for a Muslim, taking an interest in science is a very important form of worship. In many verses of the Quran, God instructs Muslims to investigate the heavens, the earth, living things, or their own existence, and think about them. When we look at the verses, we find indications of all the main branches of science in the Quran. For example, in the Quran, God encourages the science of astronomy like this. 
He who created the seven heavens in layers. You will not find any flaw in the creation of the All-Merciful. Look again. Do you see any gaps? In another verse of the Quran, God encourages the investigation of astronomy and the composition of the earth. That is the science of geology like this. Do they not look at the sky above them? How we have made it and adorned it, and there are no flaws in it. And the earth, we have spread it out, and set thereon mountains standing firm, and produced therein every kind of beautiful growth, in pairs, to be observed and commemorated by every devotee turning to God. In the Quran, God also encourages the study of botany. It is he who sends down water from the sky from which we bring forth growth of every kind, and from that we bring forth the green shoots, and from them we bring forth close-packed seeds, and from the spathes of the date palm date clusters hanging down and gardens of grapes and olives and pomegranates, both similar and dissimilar. Look at their fruits as they bear fruit and ripen. There are signs in that for people who believe. In another verse of the Quran, God draws attention to zoology. You have a lesson in livestock. Here is a Quranic verse about the sciences of archaeology and anthropology. Have they not traveled in the earth and seen the final fate of those before them? In another verse of the Quran, God draws attention to the proof of God in a person's own body and spirit. There are certainly signs in the earth for people with certainty, and in yourselves as well. Do you not then see? As we can see, God recommends all the sciences to Muslims in the Quran. Because of this, the growth of Islam in history meant at the same time the growth of scientific knowledge. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began to preach Islam, the Arabs were a community of ignorant, superstitious tribes. However, thanks to the light of the Quran, they were rescued from superstition and began to follow the path of reason. As a result of this, one of the most astonishing developments in world history took place, and in a few decades, Islam, which emerged from the small town of Medina, spread from Africa to Central Asia. The Arabs, who previously could not even rule a single city in harmony, came to be rulers of a world empire. In his book, The Straight Path, the American expert on Islam, Professor John Esposito, describes the miraculous aspect of the rise of Islam like this. What is most striking about the early expansion of Islam is its rapidity and success. Western scholars have marveled at it. Within a decade, 
Arab forces overran the Byzantine and Persian armies and conquered Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Persia, and Egypt. Muslim armies proved to be formidable conquerors and effective rulers, builders rather than destroyers. When different peoples, including the Turks, accepted Islam of their own free will, the Islamic empire grew even more, and it became the greatest power in the world during that period. One of the most important facets of this empire was that it provided the stage for a scientific development previously unmatched in history. At a time when Europe was living through the Dark Ages, the Islamic world created the greatest legacy of scientific knowledge seen in history to that date. The sciences of medicine, mathematics, geometry, astronomy, and even sociology were developed systematically for the first time. Some commentators tried to link this Islamic scientific development to the influence of the ancient Greeks. But the real source of Islamic science was the experimentation and observations of Muslim scientists. In his book, The Middle East, Professor Bernard Lewis, an expert in Middle Eastern history, explains it like this. The achievement of medieval Islamic science is not limited to the preservation of Greek learning nor to the incorporation in the corpus of elements from the more ancient and more distant East. This heritage which medieval Islamic scientists handed on to the modern world was immensely enriched by their own efforts and contributions. Greek science, on the whole, rather tended to be theoretical. Medieval Middle Eastern science was much more practical, and in such fields as medicine, chemistry, astronomy, and agronomy, the classical heritage was clarified and supplemented by the experiments and observations of the medieval Middle East. The secret was the scientific and mental discipline taught by the Quran to Muslim scientists. The lines written by a Muslim scientist of that period in his private diary strikingly demonstrate how much alive the Quran-based concept of science was. Then for a year and a half, I devoted myself to study. I resumed the study of logic and all parts of philosophy. During this time, I never slept the whole night through and did nothing but study all day long. Whenever I was puzzled by a problem, I would go to the mosque, pray, and beg the Creator of all to reveal me that which was hidden from me and make it easy for me that which was difficult. Then at night, I would return home, put a lamp in front of me, and set to work reading and writing. I went on like this until I was firmly grounded in all sciences and mastered them as far as humanly possible. Andalusia, where most Muslim scientists were born and raised, became a major center of innovation and development, especially in medicine. Muslim physicians were trained in such varied fields as pharmacology, surgery, ophthalmology, gynecology, physiology, bacteriology, and hygiene, and they made important discoveries which laid the foundations of modern science. Here are some of them.
The advanced scientific culture of the Islamic world paved the way for the Western Renaissance. Muslim scientists acted in the knowledge that their investigation of God's creation was a path through which they could get to know him. With the transfer of this mentality to the Western world, the advance of the West began. Medieval Europe was ruled by the dogmatic regime of the Catholic Church. The Church opposed freedom of thought and pressured scientists. People could be punished by the Inquisition simply for holding different beliefs or ideas. Their books were burned and they themselves were executed. The pressure on research in the Middle Ages is often referred to in history books, but some interpret the situation wrongly and claim that the scientists who clashed with the church were against religion. The truth is the exact opposite. The scientists who opposed the bigotry of the church were religious believers. They were not against religion, but against church dogma. For example, the famous astronomer Galileo, whom the church wanted to punish because he stated that the world rotated, said, I render infinite thanks to God for being so kind as to make me alone the first observer of marvels kept hidden in obscurity for all previous centuries. The other scientists who established modern science were all religious. Kepler, regarded as the founder of modern astronomy, told those who asked him why he busied himself with science, I had the intention of becoming a theologian, but now I see how God is, by my endeavors, also glorified in astronomy, for heavens declare the glory of God. As for Newton, one of the greatest scientists in history, he explained the principle underlying his zeal for a scientific endeavor by saying, He, God, is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omniscient, that is, his duration reaches from eternity to eternity, his presence from infinity to infinity. He governs all things and knows all things that are or can be done. We know him only by his most wise and excellent contrivances of things. We reverence and adore him as his servants. The great genius Pascal, the father of modern mathematics, said that, but by faith we know his, God's existence. In glory we shall know his nature. Von Helmont, one of the leading figures of modern chemistry and the inventor of the thermometer, declared that science was a part of faith. George Cuvier, the founder of modern paleontology, regarded fossils as surviving proofs of the creation and taught that living species had been created by God. Carl Linnaeus, who first systematized scientific classification, believed in the creation and stated that the natural order was a significant proof of God's existence. Gregor Mandel, the founder of genetics, and also a monk, believed in creation and opposed the evolutionary theories of his time, such as Darwinism and Lamarckism. Louis Pasteur, the greatest name in the history of microbiology, proved that life could not be created in inert matter and taught that life was a miracle of God. The famous German physicist, Max Planck, said that the creator of the universe was God 
and stressed that faith was a necessary quality of scientists. Albert Einstein, regarded as the most important scientist of the 20th century, believed that science could not be godless and said, science without religion is lame. A large number of other scientists who guided scientific history were religious people who believed in God. These scientists all believed in God and served science with the intention of discovering the universe which he had created. As God decreed in the Quran, they thought about the creation of the heavens and the earth and investigated in the awareness of God. The birth of science and its development were the result of this awareness. During the 19th century, however, this awareness was replaced by a fraud called materialism. The 19th century was a period which witnessed the greatest errors in human history. These errors began with the imposition of European thought of materialist philosophy and ancient Greek teaching. The greatest error of this period was Darwin's theory of evolution. Before the birth of Darwinism, biology was accepted as a branch of science which provided evidence of the existence of God. In his book, Natural Theology, the famous biologist William Paley maintained that, to the extent that every clock proves the existence of a clockmaker, Natural designs prove the existence of God. However, Darwin rejected this truth in his theory of evolution. By distorting the truth to fit materialist philosophy, he claimed that all living things were the result of coincidences. In this way, he created an artificial separation between religion and science. In their book, The Messianic Legacy, English researchers Michael Bagent, Richard Lay, and Henry Lincoln 
have this to say on the subject. For Isaac Newton, a century and a half before Darwin, science was not separate from religion, but on the contrary, an aspect of religion, and ultimately subservient to it. But the science of Darwin's time became precisely that, divorcing itself from the context in which it had previously existed and establishing itself as a rival absolute, an alternative repository of meaning. As a result, religion and science were no longer working in concert, but rather stood opposed to each other, and humanity was increasingly forced to choose between them. Not only biology, but also branches of science such as psychology and sociology were twisted according to the materialist philosophy. Astronomy was distorted according to the materialist dogmas of ancient Greece. The new aim of science was to confirm materialist philosophy. These incorrect ideas have dragged the scientific world into a dead end for the past 150 years. Tens of thousands of scientists from different branches worked in the hope of being able to prove Darwinism or other materialist theories. But they were disappointed. The scientific evidence showed the exact opposite of the conclusion they wanted to reach. That is, it confirmed the truth of creation. Today, the world of science is astonished by this truth. When nature is examined, it emerges that there is a major plan and design in every detail, and this has cut away the foundations of materialist philosophy. For example, the extraordinary structure of DNA shows scientists that it is not the result of an accident. The DNA in a single human cell contains enough information to fill a whole 900 volume encyclopedia. Gene Myers, a scientist from the Celera company which administers the Human Genome Project, says this. What really astounds me is the architecture of life. The system is extremely complex. It's like it was designed. There's a huge intelligence there. The astonishment affects the whole scientific world. Scientists are viewing with surprise the invalidity of the materialist philosophy and Darwinism, which they were taught as truth, and some of them are declaring this openly. In his book, Darwin's Black Box, one of these figures, the American professor of biochemistry, Michael Behe, describes the situation of the scientific world like this. Over the past four decades, modern biochemistry has uncovered the secrets of the cell. The progress has been hard won. It has required tens of thousands of people to dedicate the better parts of their lives to the tedious work of the laboratory. The result of these cumulative efforts to investigate the cell, to investigate life at the molecular level, is a loud, clear, piercing cry of design. The result is so unambiguous and so significant that it must be ranked as one of the greatest achievements in the history of science. But no bottles have been uncorked, no hands clapped. Why does the scientific community not greedily embrace its startling discovery? The dilemma is that while one side of the issue is labeled intelligent design, the other side must be labeled God. The same situation exists in astronomy. The astronomy of the 20th century has demolished the materialist theories of the 19th. First, with the Big Bang theory, it emerged that the universe had a beginning, 
the moment of creation. Since then, it has been realized that in the universe, there is an extraordinarily delicate balance which protects human life. For these reasons, in the world of physics and astronomy, atheism is in rapid decline. As American physicist Robert Griffiths jokingly remarks, if we need an atheist for a debate, I go to the philosophy department. The physics department isn't much use. In short, in our day and age, materialist philosophy is collapsing. Science is rediscovering certain very important facts rejected by materialist philosophy. And in this way, a new concept of science is being born. For example, the famous Australian microbiologist Michael Denton states that the complex organs of living things cannot be explained by evolution. And this is a very profound question, which everybody skirts, everybody brushes over, everybody tries to sweep under the carpets. The fact is that the majority of these complex adaptations in nature cannot be adequately explained by, by a, that their, 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 their emergence occurred by a, a series of intermediate forms. Um, and this is, in fact, something which, in fact, as far as I'm concerned, this is a fundamental problem. And uh, the fact that there are so many of these things for me, okay, there's something wrong with the theory. Common sense tells me there must be something wrong. The famous German biologist Werner Gibt explains how genetic information in living things proves the creation in these terms. It is impossible that new information is coming from a random process. If you see a computer program, it needs a programmer. If you see a car, it needs a designer. If you see the biological information in the cells, then you must say that is the right conclusion. It needs a creator who has made the program, the genes, to create the proteins, to create the organs. It is necessary that we have this. So we can say evolution is an impossible process. The American professor of biochemistry, Michael Behe, explains why the creation is a scientific fact. I think the conclusion of design is a scientific one, an empirical one, based completely on the observable system, the universe and life were intended, that they are the product of intelligent activity. And I'd just like to point out that this this idea comes from the progress of science. It is not from not what we do not know, but is rather from what we have learned over the past 50 years. The American philosopher Philip Johnson summarizes the conclusion science has reached like this. That we are here as the products of an intelligent creator that brought about our existence for a purpose. Our existence and that of other living things was due to the conscious, purposeful activity of a creator. God created the entire universe, and the whole of creation shows humanity the signs of God. Science is the method of investigating what has been created, so conflict between religion and science is out of the question. On the contrary, Islam encourages science. The major scientific advances in Islamic history clearly show the importance of this encouragement. Today, 
The 19th century theories which tried to confuse science with materialist philosophy have lost their validity. Humanity will shortly understand clearly that God created the entire universe and all living things. Science provides evidence of this creation. And the Quran, which brought the news of this truth 14 centuries ago, leads the way to science. It is a book we have sent down to you, full of blessing. So let people of intelligence ponder its signs and take heed. This is my path, and it is straight, so follow it. Do not follow other ways, or you will become cut off from his way. That is what he instructs you to do, so that hopefully you may do your duty.